Today we're going to take a look at section 2.5, which is inverse functions. But before we can actually get to inverse functions, we have to define another type of function that you've probably seen before. And at least if you haven't seen this, you've seen the variation of this because I've shown it to you. So the function we're going to talk about is called a one-to-one -one function. So functions one-to-one, -one, um, when every element of the range corresponds to exactly one element of the domain. And we almost saw a definition that said this very same thing earlier in the semester, but it wasn't about one-to-one. -one. It was about simply what a function was. In a function, every element of the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. But in a one-to-one -one function, you reverse the domain in the range, and the same has to be true as well. Um, another way to describe that is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Every element of the domain has exactly one element in the range. Every element in the range has exactly one element from the domain. Okay, so there's this one-to-oneness going on, and that's why you're seeing that one-to-one -one function. There's a correspondence between the domain and the range values. All right, so we're going to take a look at just a couple of numerical, like, ordered pair sets of um, sets of points. And the questions are, are these functions one-to-one? -one? Okay, so what we're supposed to do is that every element of the range has exactly one element of the domain. So in um, part, or on part A, what are the element or elements of the range? What do we have? <coughs> What's in the range on part A? Four. That's it, right? Just four. And does four have exactly one element of the domain that corresponds to it? Tim says no, and you're right, Tim. What are the elements that correspond to the element four? Two and, two. two and negative two. We have two elements in the domain that correspond to the same element four in the range. Okay? So if it's one-to-one, -one, that can't happen. So this is simply not a one-to-one -one function. And it's no. And I'll write down why. I know it doesn't ask me for this, but I'd like for you to write it down for yourself, too, just so that when you're looking back at this later, you'll remember how we made that decision. No, because four which is the value in the range, corresponds to 2 elements of the domain. They happen to be 2 and negative 2, but it's because it's 2 elements of the domain. Okay, with the weird coloring on the screen, the white's not really working for me. How about you guys? Let me try black and see if that comes up better on the next one. It's kind of freaking me out, too. Um, okay, how about the second one on part B? What elements do we have in the range? Again, we're looking at range first on this one. Two, negative two, and eight. Two, negative two, and eight. There are three of them in this one, right? Do they each correspond to exactly one element of the domain? Yes, they do. So this one is one-to-one. -one. You can't read that any better. Um, it looked blue, yep. Yeah. Okay, let me write this down, and we'll <coughs> see if we can take a second to readjust something. Um, so yes, and it's because each element in the range corresponds to exactly one element in the domain. All right, so we had a line test before. We had the vertical line test. The vertical line test talked about whether or not something actually created a function. We dropped vertical lines down. We looked at whether or not it crossed the graph twice. Well, we have a horizontal line test on this one. A function is one-to-one -one if no horizontal line crosses the graph more than once. So a graph is a function if no vertical line crosses it more than once. And it's one-to-one -one if no horizontal line crosses it more than once. It works the exact same way. 
we're looking at the graph, um, and we're drawing horizontal lines now, though, instead of vertical lines to decide if it actually has this property. All right, so when I flip the screen, it's going to give you an equation. Um, and when it gives you the equation, I'd like for you to sketch the graph. This is basically what we were doing back in section 2.3, when you just took the quiz over. Okay, so you guys know how to draw this graph. Um, we have an absolute value graph. Can you describe to me in words how this has shifted from the normal absolute value graph that you know and love? Move down, one. down one, that's part of it. <coughs> and right two. Okay. So draw your graph, moved your graph of um, absolute value x, which looks like a what shape? A V shape. And it's going to be moved down one and right two. Okay, so here's my uh, right two, here's my down one. And if I go up one and right one, up one and left one, I will have my other two points. So the sketch looks something like this. All right, now thinking about what the last slide said, you guys were all jotting it down. Horizontal line test. If I draw horizontal lines, what's going to happen with this graph? It'll cross. It'll cross. Can you be more specific, Dylan? Twice. Yeah. Most places it'll cross twice, right, Grace? Yeah. So if I go through like this, here's an example of one of those spots. I'm actually going to cross the graph twice. Now, there's also some places where I don't cross the graph at all. That's really not here nor there. It doesn't matter. But it's this spot. Oh, my goodness. That was really a big, bold, wasn't it? Okay, let's try again. This spot and this spot, they cross twice. Um, obviously, I could draw a line through the, the, the corner on the bottom, and it would only cross once. It's not really the point. The point is that if I can ever draw the line horizontally and cross it twice, what does that mean? It's not one-to-one. -one. That's what exactly what it means. So by visually checking this, we can simply say that it's not one-to-one. -one. And the reason why is because of the, and I'll abbreviate, HLT, horizontal line test. Okay? It's a horizontal line test that tells us that. All right, so let's move on into what the actual des description um, of our section was, which is inverse functions. The inverse, it's got this notation where it looks like it's got a, sub a superscript of a negative 1. Um, this is read f inverse of x. Okay, that's how I read this notation, f inverse of x. So the inverse, f inverse of x, of a 1 to 1 function, f, undoes the original function. So it does everything the original function did, but reverse. Um, and you've seen that happen with um, some of the different inverse, um, like um, multiplicative inverse numbers, right? So like um, reciprocals, you know, one half, multiplying something by one half and then multiplying it by two. Those just switch each other, right? I mean, they're opposite operations. They undo one another. So it's the same idea, but for a function instead of for a number, okay? Um, notice in this definition itself, it tells you that the graph has to be what? One-to-one. One. That's why we talked about that before. If you have a function that's not one-to-one to, one to start with, you can't even create an inverse. Okay? So we do want to, at the very beginning of each of the functions, and I'll have to tell you that most of the time your book's not going like, to try to trip you up or anything, but you should be aware that there are cases um, when you will not have an inverse. And if you try to do the steps for finding the inverse, you'll find something, but it won't be a function, okay? So taking a look at these two steps, and there's really just two steps for finding an inverse of a function. You switch x and y, so literally that means that where it said x before, it now says y, and where it said y before, it now says x. Now there's other names for y. What other names do we sometimes have for y? F of x. F of x. So it might actually say f of x in your problem, and you're replacing the f of x with x, okay? So whatever the y actually you know, means in that piece of the problem, that's the part you're changing for x. And then you solve for your new y value. And the last step at the end is to use the proper notation, that f inverse notation, to write your answer. Okay? But the two real issues are to do this, switch x and y, and then solve for y. So we're going to do some examples of this. Um, some of them are really straightforward, and some of them are a little bit harder to deal with. 
Um, so this first one's really straightforward. It says f of x on the left, but you know that f of x just means y. Okay, so really this is saying, and if it helps you to, to write that out, to remind yourself, write that piece out first. This is really saying x, uh, y equals x over 2. This is the function you have. <laughs> okay, so the first step, I'll number them even, is to switch x and y. So where it now says y, I'm going to write x, and where it now says x, I'm going to write y. Everybody good so far? That's step one, done. Step two is to solve for y, and solving for y is not terribly difficult for this particular function. What do you have to do to solve for y? Multiply by two. Yeah, you have to multiply by two. So we'll multiply both sides by two. We end up with two x equals y or if you want to write it as y equals 2x. That's how we would write it with the left-hand side. We're really done. For all intents and purposes, we have found the inverse, but we're going to notate that the inverse has been found using that notation that we saw on the last slide. In particular, this y value has a new name. It's called f inverse of x. Okay. And notice, if it started out, whoops, sorry about that. If it started out as f of x, it will end as f inverse. If it started as g of x, it would end as g inverse. You guys are brilliant. Yeah, and so they just match. Whatever the name is to begin with, it's that name with an inverse notation to end with. So would the <coughs> be? It will be like, this. So it would look like that. It will look just like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. got it. Okay, now... B is a little bit more difficult. Oh, let me make one more comment about part A. Um, I didn't notice it with you, like I didn't say it out loud, um, but this is a one-to-one -one function. Do you know what the equation of x over 2 or 2x is? I mean, what, are, what are those equations of? Lines. They're lines. Um, and if you imagine drawing a line, I don't care how you draw it unless you were drawing it horizontally or vertically, which would, those would be odd um, um, awkward equations. But do you notice if I draw these lines that they pass the horizontal line test? Yeah, so they're one-to-one -one functions, so that's why this process is working, is because these functions are, in fact, one-to-one. -one. Just kind of to make you note of that. Uh -huh. When it comes to writing function, is it really so critical that y be in front of y be, y be the first thing you see? Do you mean, like, this piece versus this piece, Anna? Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. Most people like to see it listed first. It's just one of those like OCD things in our brain that likes to see it written that way. But there's nothing wrong about it the other way. Yeah. Um, okay, next one is a little bit more difficult. Um, not because it's a harder way to solve it, but just because it's got a cube root in it. Um, and cube roots are harder than division and multiplication, I guess, basically. Um, the process is still the same, right? We're going to replace x with y and y with x. And we understand that whether it's written or whether it's just understood, we know that this is y on the left, okay? So as we're replacing it, this f of x will become, step one, x, and the x will become y. And very much what we have to do now is we have to undo all of the stuff that's on the right, okay? So how do we get rid of a cube root? Cube it. We cube it. So we're going to cube both sides. <coughs> so now I have x cubed on the left. What's on the right? y minus 9. Good. Again, I've got a minus 9 with the y. How do I move it? Right, I add it over. So this is x cubed plus 9 on the left now, and it's y on the right. And we're done. I mean, like, this is really the answer. Notationally, we will replace it. And just because um, I told Anna it's the case, and I will make it true as well here, we can write the f inverse of x on the right-hand side. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, and then the x cubed plus 9 on the left. So our final answer looks like this. It's not terribly difficult, right? No. We're just, it's, it's like solving equations. It's just like this extra x and y switch step at the beginning and then the notation at the end. All right, the next one I'm going to warn you is more difficult, and I think you'll see why as we start it. Um, process is the same, switch x and y's. 
So what will I write and where? Can somebody tell me how to rewrite this? Okay, so you've told me the right-hand side. It's y plus 3 over y minus 5, and it equals x. Good. Okay, so this is what, what we've got. Can you tell me just by looking why this one's going to be harder to solve for y? Is it a fraction? Um, there are fractions, but there was fraction on the first one, and it wasn't hard to solve. There's something else. Well, you have the top and bottom. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to even change what you said just a little bit. I have <laughs> y in two places. Do you guys see that? There's <clears throat> two different places where y is written. And because of that, that makes the process a little bit trickier to solve for. It's not impossible. It's not even really crazy hard. It's just, it's just really different looking. Okay? So what do we do? Well, the first thing you have to recognize is that as long as one's in the numerator, one's in the denominator, you're stuck. You can't have one in the denominator in order to make this work. So we've got to get the one out of the denominator. So how do we get the denominator to go away? And multiply it. Good. Okay, so we're going to multiply both sides by the denominator. Or um, you might think of it as being cross-multiplication. Do you guys remember that from, like, elementary, middle school kind of thing where you first saw that cross-multiply? Okay, that's another way to think about it. So basically we need to take this piece right here and we multiply both sides by it. Okay, so I'm going to leave that rewritten over here. So I've got x times y minus 5 on the left. And on the right, I just have y plus 3, because the whole point of doing that was to cancel the denominator, right? Okay, can we distribute out what's on the left? What do you get when you distribute that out? Uh, xy minus 5x. Okay, so again, the goal is to solve for y. So any idea what you might need to do in order to make that happen? Dividing by y, we'll be doing just exactly what we tried to undo. We'll put a y back in the denominator. So that's not going to help. Subtract 3. Okay, so subtract 3. In, in general, we are going to do that in a minute. Divide by x. Nope, not going to divide by x. So one of the things that I told you that was problematic, and Jonathan mentioned it, was that there was an, a y on the top and the bottom, right? And I said I'm going to reword this. The problem really is that the y's are in different places. Do you see that the y's are still in different places? Mm -hmm. They're not in a numerator and denominator, but they're still in different places, and that's a problem. So what do I need to do about that? I need to get them on the same place. In this case, I need to get them on the same side. Okay? So yes, I am going to end up moving a constant one way or the other, but I'm also going to end up moving a y one way or the other. So I'm a fan of moving the y to the left. Are you guys good with that? Yep. Okay. So if I move the y to the left, then I'm going to subtract my y here. Um, it also means that I'm going to add the 5x. Instead of moving the 3, I'm going to move the 5x. Okay, so don't go combining things that are really not like terms. We're just going to have to rewrite. So I've got an xy minus y on the left, and I've got a uh, 3 plus 5x, or 5x plus 3 if you prefer, on the right. Are the y's in the same spot now? Yes, they are, and that's really good news, okay? And then everything else that does not have a Y is over here on the other side as well. That's also good news. So here's the trick when you have more than one Y. Okay, you got to get them all grouped up on the same side just like we did. But the trick then is to factor that value out. Notice everything on the left-hand side has a Y in it, right? So we're going to factor the Y out of it. And then it won't be in it anymore. So if I take this Y out, right, common factor xy divided by y would be x, and then the y at the end would be minus the 1. Okay? Now we're going to get to something that, um, I don't know, a couple of you said something about dividing by x, and that's actually where we are now. So these two pieces now have the ability to be separated. Because they're multiplied, one piece alone has the y in it, and the other piece has everything else. So I can take the piece that's the everything else, and I can divide it to the other side. So my next step, I'm going to move this one up too, in fact. <coughs> my next step then is to divide both sides by x minus 1. So I have y on the left, and I have 3 plus 5x over x minus 1 on the right. 
All right? If you've done it correctly, the only place you have y is on the left, or at least all on the same side, and everything else is on the other side. And that's what we did. So our last step then from this would be to rewrite the y how as, as the inverse. And it was starting out as f, so it will be f inverse, right? So this would be f inverse of x equals 3 plus 5x divided by x minus 1. All right, I have one more example that's much like these, um, same directions anyway, finding the inverse. It has a funny little notation that we haven't seen at the end of it. It says x is greater than or equal to 0. Um, I wanted to put this in here in particular because I wanted you to know that that x is greater than or equal to 0 doesn't affect you doing the problem at all. What it does, however, is it makes the function 1 to 1. What is this a graph of 1 minus x squared? It's a parabola. Okay, and it happens to be a parabola opening downward, not that it really matters, but it is a parabola. And if I were to try to do a horizontal line test with this, what would happen? It would fail. It would fail. If I try to do a horizontal line test, it would fail. So the reason that they've put this in here at the end is because your function is not really, oops, is not really the whole graph. It's just going to be half of it. If you have half of it, does it pass the horizontal line test? Yes. Yeah. So basically they're saying we can do the same process if we eliminate part of the domain so that it won't cause this problem with it being one-to-one. -one. Okay, so I bring it up not because I'm trying to confuse the issue, but because I want you to recognize that they're actually making the problem easier for you. They're making it able to be worked out. That, that's it. So, as you take a look at the problem, you solve it and you work with it exactly the same way. We replace the f of x with x, and we replace the x with y. And then we work through the process to simplify and solve for y. So, what will I do first? Subtract 1. So, I have x minus 1 equals negative y squared. Now what? We are going to square root it, but we need to do one more thing first got to divide by the negative 1. Okay, so dividing by negative 1 just switches all my signs. You can either write that as negative x plus 1. I'm sorry. Yeah, negative x plus 1. Or you can write it as 1 minus x either way. And then I do have a y squared on the right. And then what? Right, and then we take the square root. Now normally, um, in fact many times this semester already, I've said if you put the square root on, what do you have to do? You have to put a plus or minus, and that is a true statement. Here, we don't have to, and the reason we don't have to comes back to the fact that they told us that the x values are greater than or equal to 0, which now means that the y values are greater than or equal to 0 because we switched x and y. The y values are automatically for this function greater than or equal to 0. So we don't need to put a plus or minus on. In fact, we should not put a plus or minus on. So this is y equals the square root of 1 minus x. And then our last part of our answer would be to be replacing the uh, y with f inverse of x. And this would be a half of a sideways parabola is what it would end up looking like if we looked at it actually, just so you know. All right, last piece in this section is talking about the fact that if you do in fact have inverse functions, and you compose them, composition like we did last time, then the result is x. So if you put the g of x function inside of f of x, or the f of x function inside of g of x, and you simplify them out, they will give you the same thing. Right? It's like if I take a right on Kickapoo, and then I take a, a left on MacArthur, and then I take a this, and then I take a that, and then I reverse all those directions, I end up exactly back where I started. Because that's what undoing a function means. It's what an inverse is. It undoes everything. It gets you back to where you started with. So checking for this is really uh, much like what we were doing in the last section. You're going to do two things. We're going to start with the first one they list, which is f composed g of x. So what does that really mean? Well, what it really means is the g of x function here is going to go here in place of x. 
you're going to replace it. So the 20 stays the same, the minus 5 stays the same, and the x gets replaced with negative 0.2x plus 4. And you simplify. So let's do that. I've got my 20 at the beginning. What's negative 5 times negative 0.2x? Is it positive or negative? Positive. Positive. What's 5 times 0.2? It's 1, yeah. And then I've got the x. So this is like 1x or just x, right? 0 0.2 is the same as 1 fifth. So this is 1 fifth times 5. That's what you're actually seeing. And then I have the negative 5 here times the 4. So what's <coughs> negative 5 times 4? Minus 20. And then what do you notice? Yeah, then minus 20 and the positive 20 cancel. They add to 0, so I'm left with simply x. And that's the checking. I mean, that's, that's what we did. It, it equaled x. We expect that it will, um, or at least that's what we're testing to see if it does. Um, and then the other direction, so let me erase. The other direction would be to take what's in g of x, or in f of x, and replace it for g of x. So we're going to do g of f of x, like this. So it's replacing... the x over here with the f of x function. So my g of x function has a negative 0 0.2. And then in place of the x, I'm going to write in 20 minus 5x. And then I have plus 4 at the end. OK, so what is negative 0 0.2 times 20? <laughs> negative 4. And then I have the negative and negative, and it's the point 0.2 and the point and the 5, which we did before, is positive 1x. And then plus the 4, and what do you notice? Force cancel. The force cancel, leaving me with x. So if it works in the both directions, which is what we tested, then we can answer the question. We need to make sure we're answering the question. It says, are they inverses? And the answer then would be yes, they are. Let's try another one. Any questions on that one? I'm sorry, I should have asked. OK. Try another one. This looks a little scary because there's a fraction involved. It's really not that scary. Process is still the same. We're going to take what's inside of G and put it in, or take what G is and put it inside of F. So I've got F composed G of X. And I'm doing a replacement. The X is in the numerator. And I'm going to replace it with 5x plus 3. And then I have minus 3 divided by 5. So what do you notice? Start with the numerator. What do you notice in the numerator? Yeah, the plus 3 and the minus 3 cancel, right? The numerator is really just the same as 5x. And then what do you notice? The 5s cancel as well. So I'm left with x. OK, let's try the other direction, g of f of x. So to do g of f of x, I'm going to switch my um, substitution. I'm going to take what f of x is equal to, and I'm going to plug it into the function g. So I've got 5. And then inside here, I've got this fractional piece, which is x minus 3 over 5. <coughs> and then plus the 3 at the end of the g of x function. So take a look at the first part where the multiplication is occurring. What do you notice? Five's the 5's cancel, right. OK, so that leaves me with x minus 3 plus 3. What do you notice? Yep, the 3's cancel now as well. So I'm left with x. Are f and g inverses? Yes. OK, one last example of this. Same question. We will take the g of x function and plug it in. So this is f compose g of x. The numerator is where the x is, so that's going to be replaced with 3x. And it's divided by 2.
So what do you have? What's going on on this one? Yeah, this does not equal x, right? Three halves is not the same as one. It just isn't. So really and truly, we could stop right here. If it doesn't work in both directions, we know that it's not the, they're not inverses, right? And actually on this one, if we tried it in the other direction, it does not work either. Just so that you can see that happen, I'm going to show you. Um, but this piece, if I tried plugging it in over here, I would have g compose f of x, and I would have 3 times x over 2. It also does not equal x. These don't always have to equal each other. This one they did, but um, they wouldn't have to. These don't equal x, which means that the answer is no, they are not um, inverses of one another.